It is a global event, the type of which most people experience only once in a lifetime. A worldwide health crisis that has taken lives and livelihoods and for a time hope. COVID-19 was declared a global pandemic in March of 2020 by the World Health Organization. That declaration drove much of modern society indoors under a broad sweeping shelter at home order. Coronavirus grew and spread and intensified rapidly from city to state to country. Here's a look at how LA was taken off guard by this insidious and silent virus. This is pandemic in LA. With several new cases confirmed in Los Angeles County, LA's elected leaders declare the worldwide coronavirus a local health emergency. I want to reiterate that this is not a response rooted in panic. We have been preparing with our local, state, and federal partners for the likelihood of this scenario. A total of six new Los Angeles cases confirmed in early March, and those numbers were expected to grow as the worldwide number of deaths and infections grow. The bit of good news is that the LA County Department of Public Health has received new coronavirus test kits from the CDC. Plans are to ramp up local testing and treatments if necessary. The city of Los Angeles, other cities in the county, and the county of Los Angeles have done everything possible to be ready. But this is everybody's responsibility. We have to be prepared. We have to protect the well-being of our loved ones. Which leads us to things we can do at home and at work to help reduce the risk of infection. First and foremost, wash your hands frequently for at least 20 seconds using soap and water. Be sure to wash thoroughly and to scrub the back of your hands as well. Hand sanitizers also work best with gels containing at least 60% alcohol. Use disinfectant wipes to clean desks and other shared office spaces. These Clorox wipes will kill most viruses and bacteria. They're also gentle enough to use on computers and smartphones without damaging them. Also, having an ample supply of essentials at home. No different than the preparedness activities we ask people to do to be ready for natural disasters, earthquakes, fires, floods, mudslides. Uh, we do need folks to plan for the possibility of business disruptions, school closures, and modifications or cancellations of select public events. We will be working closely with schools and public event venues and businesses before decisions are made to close. For Los Angeles updates on the coronavirus, log on to publichealth.lacounty.gov. The USNS Mercy arrived here in San Pedro, and I want to just thank the president personally on behalf of a grateful region, on behalf of a grateful state. Uh, for sending this ship. I know the conversations he had directly with our president and vice president is why we have today a ship that now will be the largest hospital in Los Angeles. The capacity of up to 1,000 beds uh, within that ship. And so this truly is mercy on the water. This truly is mercy at the beds. This truly is mercy and the expression of who we are as Americans and as people at this moment. We're doing everything humanly possible to prepare, but our eyes are wide open in terms of the multiples and our capacity as a system to deal with a surge of what we anticipate may require 50,000 beds over the course of the next six to 10 weeks. We will have doctors making excruciating decisions. We'll be trying to figure out what we do with that surge, how to get ventilators, where to find beds, which is why it's such a great day, at least today, to know that the USNS Mercy is here. We're not waiting around. Uh, we don't believe our fate is predetermined. 
Uh, we don't think the future just happens. It's not something to experience. It's something to manifest. You know, it's our capacity, individual capacity, to continue to make good decisions. The spirit of collaboration, the spirit of cooperation is alive and well in this state. I'm delighted to be joined by Aram Sahakian, the general manager here at the EOC. You know, things change on a day-to-day -day basis. Where are we now? What are you working towards? What are you dealing with? Where are your challenges? And where are the areas in which you're optimistic? So we're fine-tuning and uh, getting ready for uh, what's to come, which is a surge in the numbers. That's what we keep hearing. And the way we're pre preparing for that is, is uh, the hospital surge, shelters, meals to seniors, uh, PPEs, equipment to our first responders, uh, basically adding to our uh, strategic stockpile to ensure that we're ready for at least three months to four months. Hopefully it's not going to go that far, but uh, as an emergency manager, you look at the worst case scenario, but uh, all indications is is better than, it, than what it was a couple of weeks ago ago as far as numbers and when we're going to get out of this. Are you comfortable with supplies? Uh, it's challenging. Most of this stuff is coming from overseas to us. Uh, but we are receiving them slowly but surely, but we need much more. I know as part of this, you're looking at the other side and you're looking at what will happen after the crisis component is done. And, and you've said very clearly that Los Angeles is a city of business and business going in and business going out and how important that is. What is it about business that is so essential here in Los Angeles, small business in particular? Uh, you have over 500,000 small businesses in the city of Los Angeles. It's the lifeline of this economic engine, no matter how you look at it. So we are uh, also planning the recovery. Uh, we have a team right now uh, working on that alone, on the local assistance center, on uh, preparing small business loans, how to assist the small businesses and communities that are in need of these loans and so we have a whole team concentrating on this effort right now. How is the city leveraging some of the resources? You just mentioned that you've got a team. Is there definitely a plan in regards to how after all of this is over right. businesses will be supported by the emergency management department? Yes, yeah, so the local assistance centers comes into the picture. So we it's a one-stop shop basically. We will establish these centers out in, in the communities, in the business communities, we will have close to 80, 85 different agencies from local levels all the way to the federal level. And we've had this post fires where a business can walk in and we will walk them through A to Z, the process on how to reestablish themselves and, and stand up again. And that's anything and everything from loans to insurance to uh, uh, employees, anything they need. Because there has been a very substantial problem with the supply chain, you know, both what we receive here to Los Angeles and what we send out of Los Angeles as well as what we use within the city of Los Angeles. And, and we're in contact with, with all the sec sectors of the supply chain. We're in very close contact. We talk to them on a daily basis. So the grocery sector is fine. Right. Uh, the, the, the issue they had, their truck drivers, some of them were part of the vulnerable population, over 65. They addressed that. The only supply chain that, that's seeing some difficulty, when I say only two of them, the pharmaceutical industry and then the medical supply chain. Uh, so they, they're having their challenges, obviously, and they're addressing them as we speak. But I think recovery would be quicker than a lot of people think. And thank you for all of the hard work that you're doing. And thank you, Rick, for interpreting us today. And keep up the good work. I really look forward to talking to you in the future. Thank you so much. Appreciate it. Throughout this crisis, we're being reminded that our state of the city is measured in the strength of our people. It's found in our willingness to give ourselves to the common good, in quiet acts of generosity that define our Angelino spirit. So much has changed in the last few weeks, but some things are always going to be with us. Our grit, our determination, our courage, and our compassion. That is what makes LA so special and so strong. Good evening, Los Angeles. 46 days ago, our world changed. The lessons of history taught us that the cities that acted the slowest during pandemics suffered the most in the toll paid both in lives 
and livelihoods. All of us remember the 2008 recession. Until now, it was the biggest economic blow of our lifetime, and it hurt. But there's no way to sugarcoat this. This is bigger, and it will hurt more. From a fiscal perspective, this is the worst it's ever been. Our daily life is unrecognizable. We are bowed and we are worn down. We are grieving our dead. But we are not broken, nor will we ever be. That spirit we have felt each night at home and across our neighborhoods and across this city, that is the spirit that must move our economic recovery and our commitment to heal an unjust world. There is no plan, no purchase, no wall that will forever protect Los Angeles from a threat like this. But we can forever promise ourselves that the next threat we face, we will face stronger and more equal, with the chasm between rich and poor closed and covered. We can promise ourselves that we will leave behind the old normal in favor of a new justice. Our city is hurting. How could it not be? But our city is ready. Our hearts, Los Angeles, are stronger than ever. And we are the city of angels. And we will fly again. The United States federal government appears to have been largely unaware and unprepared to spring into action against COVID-19. As a result, the burden of protecting America's citizens has fallen largely on the shoulders of the states. Governors, mayors, and city councils from coast to coast were the ones who established measures and programs to defend against the impacts of the disease. The state and local level efforts to flatten the curve were swift and decisive. And at the forefront of such measures nationally was the city of Los Angeles. Guys, appreciate you. You know, you're the glue that keeps the city together. When you hear talk about unsung heroes, while everybody else is in their house, these men and women are out working. I just want to come out and show support for the, the workers that keep the city together. Yesterday was my trash day and I had a conversation with my driver and I decided after he left that I was going to surprise him, come down here and deliver masks to the workers. These are great people, they're working hard. Sometimes you need to let people know how much you appreciate the work they do and I wanted to bring them some additional supplies to help keep them safe. We have to show up here and look out for the community. We hope the community appreciate us, what we do. Sometimes it's kind of rough out here on these, these streets out here. If we don't get the uh, compliments that we should, it's okay, but we, we work with it. But now they realize and because more people is at home, so they're cleaning out garages, it's more trash, they spring cleaning, and that just make our day longer, but we're not complaining. We're showing up, we're picking it up, and we're going to be okay. These are the perfect definition of essential workers, so whatever they need, they have an ally in me, and I'm going to do what I can to get them the supplies so that they feel safe. Today we have about $50,000 in gift cards for Super King Market to help, to help the people that you see behind you in line. We found that so many families are in need. We're constantly getting phone calls from people in our community who haven't received their stimulus checks yet, who've lost their jobs, and are really uh, fighting to get food on their table for their families. And so we partner with uh, Super King Market and a Change Reaction organization to raise money so that we can handle gift cards in $300 increments to truly help these families get food on their table. I got this great help for uh, getting some extra money to help feed us. Um, some extra a gift card for a grocery store. It's gonna be big help, actually. Right now, we're having a uh, 
overall that the, the pandemic and the coronavirus and this is really help. It makes you feel a lot better that the, you know their community is looking out for you know the people in the community. You know? So um, it means a lot. There's, I'm sure there's a lot of people out here that could really use this. I myself could use it, you know, but uh, it's wonderful that this is happening. John Lee's office is, you know, doing a great thing by giving out some uh, some assistance. We're going to make sure that it, it remains safe, and as they come around, just it's as simple as that. Check their name off the box, hand them the card. Today, I'm here with D.A. Lacey to announce our Behind Closed Doors campaign. We know that staying at home means that victims of domestic violence are often trapped in those locations. The isolation of our stay-at-home orders can mask incidents of domestic violence taking place behind closed doors. There's been a 13% reduction in reports of domestic violence. I'm very concerned that this is not the consequence of less abuse happening, but rather the consequence of less reporting happening. There's been a 47% drop in reported physical child abuse and a 67% drop in reported sexual child abuse. With stay-at-home orders in place, victims may not come in contact with the people who once were mandated to help them. Traditionally, we have depended upon teachers, medical professionals, and others in our community to report these crimes when their victims cannot, or more often than not, will not. The public will be on the front lines in this effort. Neighbors, delivery personnel, plumbers, electricians, repair people, workers, gardeners. If you see something that appears not to be right, please say something. I'm asking all of you to step up and share your suspicions with law enforcement. Grocers throughout Los Angeles are gonna be posting notices that make people who come to stores aware of the resources available to them. Those are locations, among the few locations, where people who otherwise are trapped in abusive relationships might be able to leave the home, come to these places, and we're very proud to have partnered with our grocers. It's just the latest effort to apply new and innovative ways to protect the residents of Los Angeles County from crime during this pandemic. The eviction moratorium was a welcome relief to a lot of people, but what exactly are renters' rights and what are eviction protections during this COVID-19 crisis? Well, there are a lot of questions, but we have people here that have a lot of answers. I'm delighted to welcome to the studio Curran Price, council member for 9th District here in the city of Los Angeles, and Rushmore Cervantes from the LA Housing and Community Development. Let's get right to it. So, Councilman Price, how is the city of Los Angeles stepping up to bring relief to, to tenants? So we know that uh, in LA, for example, about 60% of the citizens rent. 60% are renters. Uh, in CD9 and other parts of LA, South LA, uh, that number's probably 80%. Mm -hmm. So going into this crisis, I think uh, the council is very sensitive to making sure that we have programs and policies in place that help uh, preserve housing. You know, the mayor says we should be staying at home, and we want to make sure that folks have a home to stay in. Right. So the council has done a couple of things. One, there was a uh, moratorium on evictions, which is very significant. We don't want people being kicked out during this time of uncertainty. People are getting laid off, uh, uncertainly about their medical condition. So we put a freeze on evictions. And then finally, for those tenants who have been unable to pay, uh, we're going to give them about 12 months uh, after the emergency is over to make up those payments. And so we're trying to be flexible, we're trying to be responsible. Rushmore, exactly who specifically do all these renter protections apply? Um, everyone across the board? The moratorium on evictions, as Councilman Price indicated, is across the board. Whether you've lost a job or had a reduction in, in your wages, whether you've got uh, child care issues because your children are out of school or you have increased uh, child care expenses or you're caring for a loved one or yourself that's sick or maybe even a government issue, there's no, um, no evictions that are allowed. How long are these rental protections in place, Councilman? It will be in effect through the end of the, the mayor's stay at home. Um, uh, initiative. Uh, and we don't know when that's going to be. It, you know, initially the thought was it would end about the 15th of, uh, of May, 
Uh, and there's some indication now that it may be longer than that. And the landlord cannot demand proof of of documentation as to why. Oh, interesting. That's correct. And then furthermore, uh, the property owner cannot demand that the tenant enter into a repayment agreement. That's not required under the, the local or the state orders right now. While there are periods of forbearance, it doesn't mean that, uh, that rents are going to be eliminated. The tenants have the ability to pay back the forbearance amount within 12 months. We have a new guest with us right now, Silvana Naguib. She's the supervising attorney with the Homelessness Prevention Project. The primary way that we prevent people from becoming homeless is defending them in evictions or what's known as unlawful detainers. In an ordinary year, between 40,000 and 50,000 evictions are filed in Los Angeles County. That's without a pandemic. That's without, you know, the greatest economic recession of my lifetime. And so this is already a serious issue for Angelenos, um, especially, you know, poor and, and working people in Los Angeles where their housing is insecure because they are so rent burdened. You know, there's a huge proportion of people in Los Angeles that pay over 50% of their income to rent. Silvana, it's so nice to know that there are people like you who are advocating for those who don't necessarily have the wherewithal to be able to advocate for themselves. If there are questions, if there are, if there are concerns, uh, if there's something that is not clear, ask. Now is the time. Even before 6 a.m., these senior citizens were already lined up outside the Northgate Market. That is how important safe and healthy shopping is to them, as well as actually finding some food on the shelves. The Northgate Gonzales Market and its 41 stores were among the first in Southern California to start opening their doors to seniors and disabled shoppers for early morning shopping from 7 to 8 a.m. in the wake of the coronavirus scare. The virus is often fatal to the elderly and those with health problems. At one point, hundreds lined up for the early morning shopping advantage. Why were you the first one here? Early bird gets the worm. You have gloves and a mask, too. You have to protect yourself. Oh. You know, a lot of people aren't taking this thing seriously, but this thing is killing people, so you have to protect yourself. They're honestly the most vulnerable in our community, and we want to be able to help them. Is it worth it being out here so early to go shopping? Well, honey, if we're, if we're not going to be bumped and, and pushed. They hit me the other day I went and with the card and it started bleeding. So it, they're, they're panicking. But there doesn't appear to be too much panic here. Any fears about the coronavirus? Not at all, none. I, I'm 66 and I live through worse. In fact, there are some lighter moments when shopper Anna Corona tells us her name. I'm Mexican, so. And Corona? No, I, corona, like, like, the, the like the virus. Like the beer. <laughs> and the beer. <laughs> Meanwhile, the early shopping hour gives seniors plenty of time to squeeze the fruit and look over freshly stocked produce and groceries. They could come in, the stores are really clean. They were limiting the amount of customers that could come in at a time. So they have that social distancing and so they can have the time to actually shop, not feel rushed. We wanted to look past just being a grocery store and try to help out our community. But there is quite a rush for the toilet paper. Within minutes, all that freshly stocked TP is gone. What is it with this toilet paper mania? Now tell us, uh, I see you have toilet paper. Yes. Why is toilet paper so important for everybody? I, I think just, you want to stay clean? Or you want to clean? Has that been a problem, toilet paper? Yes. Yeah, it's been a problem. Right now, they don't have any more of that. And even senior citizens, it turns out, can overdo the shopping a little bit. Well, these were my children, my, my grandkids, tostada for me. I don't know if my daughter needs this, but I got it. Uh, I mean, I'm, I'm seriously. So are you hoarding now? Yeah, not really. The senior early shopping hour has caught on at stores throughout LA. And that's a good thing, this store's owner says, as we all try to make sense of life in the time of coronavirus. We're asking people to just be kind. If you see an elderly person behind you, please allow them to go forward and be in front of you in line. Let them be before you get in and out quicker. Donald Trump, he had all kinds of warnings and shit, and ain't do nothing. The whole month of February, he ain't do shit. Money is more important than people's lives. 
I think people of color are always affected more adversely. There's nothing nobody can do about it, so you may as well accept it. It's just been more stressful than anything. I'm delighted to be joined today by Dr. Gilbert G. from UCLA. He's in the Fielding School of Public Health with an actual expertise in environmental health studies and racism. What is racism? I mean, there's obviously what we know from a generic standpoint. It's essentially a system of domination originating from slavery as an example, where it's really about power and control. Uh, both economic and social and cultural control. There's the direct effects of hate crimes on death and injury, but there's also the spillover effects of just unfair treatment, racial slurs uh, that have direct health effects. These links between discrimination and health effects are evident for African Americans, Latinos, and Asian Americans. Is there a reason or something that the body generates when somebody is put in a situation of fear? When we have these repeated instances of stress over and over, it can actually wear down the body. So imagine the analogy of a car, right? So with a car, you know, if you step on the accelerator, the car is designed to go. But if you're always mashing on the accelerator, eventually the engine's gonna wear down, the tires are gonna wear down, same thing with our bodies. We think that the stress from discrimination leads to something called allostatic load, which is essentially wear and tear on our bodies from chronic stress. And that in turn affects other systems in our body like the immune system, the brain, and all these other things. And that's part of the reason why we see a diversity of health problems um, related to experiencing discrimination. There is a possibility a very real possibility that the elements of racism that have played into this particular situation are going to have terrible effects on communities as well. Discrimination can make people more reluctant to seek care and to be out and about. So if people are worried that their providers are gonna discriminate against them, they may be less likely to go seek care. Health is also the product of where you live and where you work and where you play. People with high levels of education tend to be healthier than people with low levels of education. People with less education have, are, are sicker compared to people with more education. We might see that gap widening as a result of this, right? Because schools are disrupted, but some schools have more resources to do online learning, some schools have less. So you're gonna see probably a widening of the educational divide, and alongside the widening of the educational divide, I would predict a widening of sort of health divide as well. As individuals, how can we be sensitive so that, you know, we as people make sure that we are not making things worse? First of all, just have a spirit of generosity. Think about be, being a little more generous with some of your basic supplies and, and understanding that germs don't respect political boundaries or respect identities. But maybe this is an opportunity for us to become more clear and more aware of these disparities that we weren't necessarily paying attention to before. Our public health infrastructure is not where we would want it to be. Mm -hmm. You know, the United States spends more on health care than any other country in the world, but our health indicators are actually not really good. Hopefully, on the other side of this, uh, it will not be as, um, as critical as it feels right now. I agree 100%. All right. Thank you so much, Dr. Thank you. You just got to get out there and try. The, th the thing is not to sit home stagnant. If you're going to sit home, make the best of the time that you have. So the Los Angeles Public Library unfortunately had to close like uh, most other institutions in the city. So the Street Fleet Program, which is our van right behind me there, we have a, a fleet of three Street Fleet vans that are going to cover the city of LA. And these vans are designed to bring the library to people. We have some shelters, some COVID shelters. They have people that would like to read. We're bringing the library to them. We're bringing them books so that they can have something to read while they're in quarantine. So these are shelters that were not in existence prior to the pandemic that are housing um, unhoused residents of LA during the COVID-19 pandemic. We cannot check out books. The library is going to 
take back at this time. So any books that we are giving out are for the residents to keep. They're, they're books that we've had on our shelves that we have, have weeded out. They've been replaced by other books and we're donating them. This van here, this green one, is going to cover the downtown area, Northeast LA and the Hollywood region. The orange van, which is a pumpkin orange, it'll be in the San Fernando Valley, east and west. And then we have another team that will be in the magenta van and they're gonna be in the central southern. It's changing the face of the way that not just the LAPL does business, but libraries across the world are gonna do business. We're gonna to have to look at more digital content and more of the way that we can, we wanna reach people because we are not, you know, people laugh at me because I say we are no longer just the house of books. We are technology driven too. And I think that that's part of the, what this is doing is it's bringing it to the forefront. The library is also providing other services from the librarians who are staying at home. So you'll see children's librarians providing online story times, adult librarians providing online uh, programs as well. Hi everyone, welcome to Mini Digital Storytime, day six. Hello everyone, hopefully you can hear me. Um, I am today gonna show you how to access our e-media uh, with your phones. The library is continuing to try to engage with the community so that they know that we're still here for them. We're the street fleet, look for the vans, we're, we're gonna be out. If you see us, wave, take our picture, hashtag us, put it on social media, we can't wait to be a, a part of everything. The coronavirus, COVID-19, brought with it a trifecta of bad news for health, for finances, and now as it turns out, for mental health as well. I'm delighted to welcome Joanne O'Brien and Dr. Laura Kokinda from LA City Medical Services. Dr. Kokinda, as a, as a species, how are we at adapting to such uh, stressful and dramatic changes in our lives? You know, humans are actually quite resilient and quite adaptable, which is the good news. Lots of things that psychologists are recommending now is first of all, keep your routine to some degree. It's going to look very different. That's something we all have to accept, but try to keep a, a routine. if you're working from home, try to get out of your PJs, get into some sort of work frame of mind. And we don't mean your daytime PJs from right. your nighttime. We actually mean actual get dressed. <laughs> At least to some degree, yes. I love that whole idea of not being perfect. I think all of us are, you know, obviously not necessarily understanding what's going on, or if we do understand what's going on, not understanding where it's gonna go. And then feeling as if we have to be uh, brave and bold and strong and a teacher and a mom and a worker and if you're working remain but but it, you can give yourself a little bit of a permission slip during this time to not be that perfect person you can always give yourself that permission slip within reason but now especially it's not about winning the pandemic it's about getting through the pandemic keeping everyone safe healthy balanced that's what you're looking to do there are some good things i see more families together outside walking you know where you didn't see that before enjoy the moment of being together with your family because we're always so busy usually this seems to be a really good time for people to pick up new uh, uh new pastimes and new skills i know that that's one of the things that a lot of people have decided to do in order to make this time valuable personally you made banana bread. I did, I'm on the list of the million other people apparently who've been making banana bread lately. But it's, that goes back to the coping skills. You wanna keep yourself busy. It distracts from the, the negative thinking, the worry, the stuff that's not productive. So when all this is passed and you know we look back, how has Los Angeles done? I'm completely impressed on how Los Angeles has handled it. I think everybody really worked together. Everybody did what they were supposed to do. And you can see it by the, the numbers. Mm -hmm. So if you just watch those and, and if you're data driven, but it's been pretty impressive of how the whole community has come together and helped each other. I think that's what's been amazing. It's often said that in a crisis, people will either find untold strength and resolve or buckle under the pressure. Here in the City of Angels, we have done far more than find our strength. We have risen to the challenge by adapting to life-saving behaviors. We have reached out to our fellow Angelinos socially, economically, compassionately. 
we have unified, coalesced, and remained committed to getting through the health crisis together. Here's a brief look at how residents across SoCal are getting each other through this crippling pandemic. Well, it's that time of year where LA City plans its budget for fiscal 2021, but there is no such thing as business as usual these days. Fortunately, I'm joined by Councilman Paul Corian, who is the chair of the Finance and Budget Committee, and he can walk us through how things are going to work this year. In a city of our size, obviously the budget is an exceptionally complex uh, beast. The biggest revenue sources that the city has are property tax, sales tax, our business tax, uh, and the temporary occupancy tax that comes from hotel stays. Well, what a difference a year makes. Last year, uh, the city basically celebrated eliminating any kind of structural deficits. It was in a really good, solid uh, fiscal position, great reserve fund, and this is a different realm right now. So what are some of the, the key changes? In this unprecedented environment that the country, the world is in because of COVID-19, um, there's tremendous unpredictability about this budget. I've been budget chair now for eight years. And even when we were still in the Great Recession, there has never been a time like this where our revenues are so unpredictable, our expenses are so unpredictable, what support we may get or not get from the federal government in terms of stimulus and, and other things, completely unpredictable. And we usually have a very precise method of predicting revenues uh, based on historical experience. Sure. We, we can just shred all that historical experience and throw it out the window right now because we're in uncharted territories. So uh, the mayor's budget proposal uh, is appropriately extremely conservative. Um, he's projecting a revenue growth of less than 2%, whereas in the normal, in recent years, we've been projecting over 5% annual growth. And that makes a great deal of difference in our budget because, as I mentioned, most of our revenue sources are economically sensitive. Sure. When there's economic growth, we get a lot more sales tax. Property tax goes up. The businesses have more gross receipts. So there's more gross receipts tax. People are traveling, so we get our hotel tax. People are building things, so they're paying permit fees. All of those things happen when there's a vibrant economy. When there's not a vibrant economy, and when we're facing the economic catastrophe that the world is facing right now, all of those revenue sources decline dramatically. If there's any good news in the budget this year, it's that in the time that I've been budget chair for the last eight years, we have methodically built up the largest reserve fund in the history of the city of Los Angeles. We started the budget stabilization fund under my chairmanship, first time we've ever had one. So those two things taken together give us the ability to ride out downturns in the economy Councilman Krikorian, thank you for all you do, and I wish you a world of luck, and I will uh, stay optimistic with you. Thank you very much. Last week, Mayor Garcetti announced his uh, partnership with the Hospitality Training Academy and Unite Here Local 11. Um, to start this program called Serving Our Community. So today we're feeding uh, seniors uh, in a partnership with the uh, city. Really, really excited that we got to launch and kick things off here um, with our partners at USC today. We're pr producing five different meals for two separate deliveries, so the seniors are getting 10 meals a week. started, you know, I say, what, what can I do to help? It makes me feel very proud, you know. We want to be a part of the community. It feels great to be part of the process to help the most vulnerable. It's really important for us to be able to help those that are in need. It's, it's the right thing to do. They have no family, they have no strength to go out, so they have to be safe at home. 
as, as a union, we've always believed in the power of coming together when things get difficult. And so I believe this is one of those instances, right, where we're coming together with our community, with our workers, with our employers, right, with the city to really say we need to step up and someone needs to provide these services. And so it just makes me really proud. So currently we're doing 8,000 meals a week and uh, logistically it's a challenge, but uh, we make do. that other cities and other counties look at LA and make it a model to follow. We are here in this beautiful garden in the middle of Westlake and basically we are uh, giving out produce to all the families here in Westlake. Uh, we transform with Cultiva LA, the, one of our partners on this, uh, this empty lot into this beautiful garden that now is feeding uh, families in the neighborhood. And the idea is to make bags for about 300 plus individuals in the Westlake and Pico Union community. We do this on every Thursday. Uh, this is part of our response, but it's also kind of our commitment to uh, neighborhood gardens and to organic food. They could volunteer by going to our website at cultivala.org. We have a tab for do uh, donations and also for volunteers. With the people that are coming here, we are also doing the social distancing and we are doing a system called Grab and Go where the people here just get their bags and they leave. They don't like uh, do registration or any of any of that. For those people that can't come here physically because of their disability or because of their age, uh, we can uh, take those uh, by appointment. Uh, they can go to gilstedio.com uh, and maybe they can like uh, um, talk to or call our office, and in that way we can set up a, a delivery uh, time for them. One of the areas, especially the area that we're here in around Pennsylvania, near the Mariachi Plaza, is one of the most underserved areas for testing. Here in the LA County, we're having evaluation centers where you can actually come and be tested and have an evaluation from a medical doctor or, or facilitator. That way your questions will be answered, plus you will be tested and we are here to help the community. So a lot of our community didn't realize that Ultimate was here and we're available for the services for them. Um, we've been giving them free care when they're here. We're also giving them information that's vital for them for their care in the future, not just for today. AT&T's connectivity right now is, is considered essential with our mobile phones, our Wi-Fi, our TV services. And, and we're servicing customers like the people that are here today. So it's important that AT&T offers solutions to companies like Ultimed, but also that we're here in the community. We're here in the community helping people that need help today. All these tests have to be sent through Wi-Fi to the testing. That's being done because of the mobile unit that we provide the connectivity for this, this particular location. In general, this area that we're serving right now has been very, very hard hit by the coronavirus 19 in the economical part of it and the, the medical part of it. And one of the important things to reopen the economy, to reopen the services, to make sure that the community is getting the health services that they need is we need testing and evaluation. And that's why here with Altamed, we're doing that. We'll ask them questions. We uh, evaluate them through the doctor and then give them a COVID test. It usually takes five business days for the results. We're here for you. We care about the community. We care about everybody here. We want everybody to be safe. YMCA has a long legacy in the Crenshaw community. It was first established in 1952. When I first started, it was my intention to create an organization that's transformative in this community. Um, and as soon as I started, I was building up our board and 
um, COVID-19 hit, basically I had to pivot into providing emergency services to the community. Our grab-and-go um, service is uh, free breakfast and lunch meals um, to families with children. Um, we provided about 8,000 meals over the last three weeks. As we know, this pandemic has revealed a lot of um, disparities in our communities. And so it is our intention as the Crenshaw YMCA to continue providing uh, meals to seniors and those with special needs. She was very, you know, nice about letting me know because I was afraid at first to come up to inquire about it. I just happened to be walking on the street wishing that I knew where a YMCA, I had one right here under my nose, and the lady that was just talking to you, she the one told me about the program out here. Oh, it's amazing. I'm on Social Security. Um, I haven't got any help. No stimulus check, anything, um, and my kids are going to eat today. I uh, was a mother and a father, and they had three children, and they came with the three children. And uh, it just meant so much because they didn't have money. It was just priceless to see us touch a family who was really in need at that time. Financial contributions will be helpful. So going to our YMCA page and looking up our community emergency fund, ymcala.org slash Crenshaw. Still, I'll come here till it end, and that's for sure, because I have a lot of kids to feed and a family, and this is a great help to us. Yeah, it's really been great just seeing how people have really come together. Like, I've seen some of my neighbors put out, like, toilet paper. I was actually wondering when are we going back to school and are we going to stay in the same grade? When will um, sports and beaches open? Thank you so much to all the young people that have joined us. I realized as a father how difficult this is for so many of our young people. You're gonna look back on these days and while they're gonna be a huge impact, I think it's a time I'm gonna certainly be so proud of the young people of Los Angeles, how they saved this city, how they're gonna rebuild this city, and how we're all gonna fly again. My parents are essential workers, and just like the rest of my family, uh, and they all get home so late, and so that leaves me to take care of my siblings as I'm the eldest child. Well, first of all, Cindy, thank you for what you're doing for your siblings and for your family. You, you're amazing doing that, and I think we're all humbled by the way that people are helping each other, and it's a, a moment for us all to grow up a little bit, and I'm just really proud of you. It makes me smile to my face to know what you're doing for Jacob uh, and for your entire family. Um, there are many LA students with no access to the internet and thus no access to their studies. I was just wondering, what are you doing to help them not fall behind? I think until every student has a laptop in their home and has high speed internet access, we won't be equal. And that should be the goal. And just because you don't have uh, the wealth to have your own computer and pay uh, hundreds of dollars a month for high speed internet access should not be a reason that you fall behind in school. So um, I'll continue to be a really loud voice. And I've talked with Superintendent Butner to see how we can help get even more computers at home. Considering that undocumented um, families, not only across country, but specifically in Los Angeles, um, have been left out of the stimulus bill at the federal level. Um, what is uh, the mayor's office doing? So every program we're doing in the city makes sure to include everybody. So unlike the federal programs, we don't care what someone's immigration status is. You're part of the city. And if there's one thing this crisis has showed us, my health depends on your health and your health depends on my health. We were wondering, uh, Mayor Garcetti, uh, will students get counseling for the struggles and stress that have come over students' shoulders because of this pandemic? Absolutely. Um, and it is so important that everybody takes care of their mental health, too, because it is really, really a tough time for everybody. You know, we're missing prom, we're not able to see each other. Uh, if you have to FaceTime one more person, you're gonna go crazy. You can only play so many video games. Studying doesn't seem as much fun. So. Absolutely, and if you're part of LAUSD, um, there's absolute, there, there's a lot of help you can get. My friend actually started Crisis Text uh, Fund, and it's it's amazing. It's a service that allows you to have a trained professional, um, somebody who's close by here in LA, and that can really help. It's seven four one seven four one. Something like this, a virus like this, makes us feel powerless. But I want you to know how powerful you are. You're powerful to save lives. How often do you get to do that? 
You're powerful for making sure your family stays well. You're powerful for making sure your studies continue. You're powerful in terms of making sure that this virus doesn't continue to spread and that we could get back to seeing each other in real life soon. So the Westchester YMCA, in response to the COVID-19 pandemic, connected with the Red Cross of Greater Los Angeles to, to let them know that they can use any of our locations as frequently as they'd like in order to collect blood. Since the coronavirus shut down, we've had so many drives sh uh, uh, canceled on us because we're usually at high schools or places of business. In April, we're doing it every Thursday, and in May, we're doing it every Wednesday. My wife and I came this morning, we live in the neighborhood, and we are donating blood because we think this is a vital thing to do in this time of COVID. We're making sure that everyone's temperature is being checked before they enter the door. My temperature was taken a second time as I was interviewed. And they put us in chairs that were six feet apart while we were waiting. It's pretty uh, limited in how many people are in there. The cots are spaced apart uh, greater than six feet. And 95 masks. Everyone has gloves on. Wiping down all our stations after every donor. I felt really safe and I came out of here feeling like I did a good thing but I didn't put myself in huge harm's way. Honestly, I think they're doing everything that they could and I don't believe that there's a chance that you could get the virus in these circumstances. We're used to people being afraid to come because of the needles, but the virus is adding a little another layer to that. So yes, we understand that you're being anxious, but please understand that we're professionals and we know how to do it right. The response has been overwhelmingly positive. Uh, each of the scheduled events thus far have been full. We've had uh, over 100 people uh, donate blood over the past two events. I feel like I want to help with this pandemic. I feel kind of helpless right now, and it's the thing I can think to do that can make a difference. I can't really do much in my own field, so this is one way to help out other people. It makes me feel personally good. It's just so heartwarming that two of the world's oldest nonprofit organizations are able to come together and serve our community needs during this time of crisis. This is day three of our Thai drive-in movie series. We're showing uh, Thai movies in our parking lot, paired with chef-curated snacks and food. We wanted to have an activity for people to still be able to enjoy going outside and still think of Thailand, because we're the National Tourism Board and people obviously aren't traveling to Thailand right now. And the response has actually been really great, especially being at foreign films, you know, the concept is like, you know, would someone want to come out and watch a Thai movie? I love this restaurant. Ayar is one of my favorite Thai places here in Los Angeles. And I think uh, kind of like dinner in a movie is a great idea. I'm saying we want this to be a fun, but really safe activity for everyone. Everyone remains in their cars and they pull in, check in, get their snack kit and get to their um, spot on the parking lot. Once they're on their lot, they will get uh, served their food and they are given a phone number to text and add on any food throughout the movie. And we have runners to run it to their, their cars. It's great that they're doing it all in the car and it's completely social distance and it's a great way to kind of get people together. So this is great. They're doing a really good job. I think the community, Los Angelinos, are craving experiences that we used to have, but just adjusted for the new norm. Well, I think this is the new reality that we live in, right? I mean, uh, given the current restrictions, I think it's an excellent idea. It's a way to bring people in a safe environment. They they feel comfortable. They don't have to, you know, be in close contact. I guess. Uh, I believe that people feel safe 
enough to come out and, and enjoy themselves. I feel like um, drive-in is kind of like the safest thing that you could do, being contained in your own car, everyone's wearing face masks, and it's a great way to support a local business. We're also here to support the Thai elephants in Thailand because they've been obviously hit very hard by tourism and the lack of tourism in Thailand, and so this is going to aid them. We're, um, proceeds from the uh, ticket sales will go to the Thai Elephant Association. Los Angeles has the biggest community of Thais outside of Thailand. And um, we would love to bring something that brings the community together, but also something that will showcase more of our culture within Los Angeles. We really just want to have a great time. It's, it's, it's really nice to be able to see people come out, even during this time. And there's a sense of excitement. I think like everyone is just really eager to experience something new. frustrating being on quarantine, and especially if you're a musician, and your life is performing, and we don't have many opportunities to perform now, or hardly any, so you know so many people are out on their porches, and, and what we've also done is I have a limited personnel that I can use in a band, so my 13-year-old daughter is playing with me, and she's gotten really good, because this is her fourth gig, she plays a gig every Saturday now. Amazing people have come from Laurel Canyon. And this is just a continuation of that, where everybody who has a musical gift comes out on the porch at 7 o'clock on Saturdays. The fact that now with the lockdown, it's an opportunity for him to play for people and give them something to appreciate at the weekend. It's really hard when you can't listen to live music. And the fact that we have this extraordinary situation where we have all these neighbors who are musicians. It's quite an experience, you know, because it's all of your uh, friends right, right outside next to you. To be honest, it's the highlight of the entire week. I mean, all we do is go to the grocery store, walk the dog. So coming here, it just feels like a party. It feels like old times. It's been wonderful. It's been so great. And, um, you know, everybody's being safe. Everyone has their mask. We're all dying to play, and this is a way to do it in a safe way. And I think that the canyon is all about being together. And since we have to be apart, we're trying to be together, but still being apart. global pandemic has almost brought people together and made people understand what's true and real in life and understand people's priorities. So this art signifies that it doesn't matter who you are, race, ethnicity, gender, that everyone is all here for one purpose, to try to defeat that invisible enemy. it's hard to convey words and illustrations can really put a lot more thoughts and meaning into what people are thinking. This artwork, you don't have to say much, you can look at the picture and because everyone's dealing with this global pandemic, they kind of relate to it right away and understand, you know, the problems, the conflicts and how we can almost perfect and um, keep increasing the way we're looking at this world. We're going to defeat it and we're going to come out of this stronger. We have seen the light at the end of the tunnel. No vaccine yet, no return to normal yet. We have not beaten back COVID-19 entirely, but we have significantly slowed the spread here in Los Angeles. We have almost certainly thwarted its chance of ever taking hold here. And we have done so by embracing our fervent spirit of community. It is that sense of unity that will quicken Los Angeles to the day when, in the words of Mayor Eric Garcetti, we will fly once more. I'm Sayida Pagan. Thank you for watching Pandemic in LA.